Welcome back, friends. Today, we're going to talk about energy and momentum. Wait, 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 wait. I thought this was an AP Physics 2 session about thermodynamics. You're right, but we're going to definitely talk about energy and momentum because that's super, super important when we're talking about thermodynamics. Let's get started. So just like all of our sessions, we're going to go ahead and get started with what will we learn. Welcome, friends. My name is Other Strotterman, and I teach AP Physics at Lawrence Free State High School in Lawrence, Kansas. It's the home of the Firebirds, which is quite a good coincidence day for our lesson on thermodynamics. I'm also the high school co-chair of the AP Physics 2 Test Development Committee, and this video is going to be all about thermodynamics. But wait, 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 wait. We're going to actually do just a quick overview of our plans for the next two weeks. Yesterday, we talked about fluids. Today, we're doing thermodynamics, which is unit number two. Tomorrow, I'm going to cover electrostatics. And then I'm going to take a little bit of a break from do these sessions. And my good friend, Mr. Mancino from Connecticut is going to come over and he is going to do an amazing job. Way, way, way amazing job. And he's going to do circuits, magnetism, optics, and modern physics. And then I'm going to come right back at the very end and do a little bit of exam format tips and tricks for y'all. Whoa, I thought we were doing thermodynamics. Well, if you remember, I asked everybody to submit their answers to that Bernoulli's principle problem from yesterday. And I was super excited to see a lot of you guys took advantage of that on that Google form. And you guys submitted amazing answers. The question was, what was the final velocity? What was V2 and what was P2? And I've got here the answers. We talked yesterday about the velocity two being 12 because the cross-section layer got cut in half. So the speed quadrupled from three to 12. And I did a little bit of math and I got 552,000 some Pascals, which you may have gotten just a scotch of a different answer. Maybe you rounded while you're doing your addition and stuff. Maybe you wrote the numbers down and then you did the math. Or maybe use 10 as opposed to 9.8 for G, which is totally fine. You can do that on the AP Physics 2 exam. But when you look here, I got my 12 and I got my 552,000 Pascals. I've got another one of these for us to think about um, for our Google form later. But we'll get to that in just a little bit. So our agenda for today, we're getting the thermodynamics finally, friends. We're going to talk about, first off, gas laws and the quantities that we use in our gas laws. And these are the quantities that we're going to use throughout thermodynamics. These are usually state variables. I'm talking about what that term means in just a little bit. Then we're going to talk about the law of conservation of energy. Well, that's not what it says. Ah, first law of thermodynamics, same, same. Then we're going to talk about PV diagrams and thermodynamic processes. PV diagrams are kind of the free body diagram, as it were, for our thermodynamics unit. Then we're going to talk about thermal conductivity. If you remember, I told you it was supposed to snow in Kansas on April 20th, and sure enough, it did. It's all melted off by now. But nice and uh, nice thing for me is I got nice insulation in my house, which is what we'll talk about when we talk about thermal conductivity. And finally, we're going to talk about something called a Maxwell distribution, which when we get there, we'll talk about bar charts, which is, it's a Maxwell distribution. But first, what I'm going to do is do a quick review. Like I said, momentum and energy are going to be a recurring theme of this session. Very, very important. For momentum, we're going to talk about collisions. And we're going to talk about impulse when objects hit one another or when objects like gas particles hit the inside of walls, an impulse. And when we talk about energy, we're going to be talking about kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is proportional to temperature, if you remember. So that's going to be a very important thing for us. So I just want to do a quick, quick review about basic collisions using this FET simulation called Collision Lab. So I'm going to flip over to that real quick. Let's see how quickly I can get there. Look at that. It's pretty snazzy. And I want to do a couple things. One of the things I want to do real quick is review types of collisions. Three types of collisions. Elastic, that's when 100% of the kinetic energy is conserved. Elastic collisions occur at atomic level. So the gas particles all around us, they're having elastic collisions. Inelastic is a gradation range where there's kinetic energy loss. 
a totally or perfectly or completely inelastic collision when two things stick together. But you'll notice here, if I talk about um, the a kinetic energy, when I have this collision happen, you'll notice that it talks about the kinetic energy before 0.94, afterwards 0.94 as well. The other thing that I want to show you guys real quick is what happens when I have a fast moving molecule hit a slow moving molecule. So I can do that by having the velocity be bigger and this velocity be smaller, same mass molecules. And I think it's what's really important for us to remember here is that the fast thing is going to slow down. The slow thing is going to speed up. And that's what happens when you have collisions with gas molecules. The last thing I want to do real quick is think about um, 2D collisions. Because if I have a 2D collision, this is kind of like what happens inside of a container of gas. Except instead of two particles, I've got lots more than two particles, lots more than four particles as well. But it's that same sort of thing where a fast thing hits a slow thing, the slow thing speeds up and the fast thing slows down. Okay, great review of momentum. Let's head on back to our presentation. Oh, let's think preview we're gonna do in a little bit. The other thing I wanna review real quick, however, is our quantities. These are the quantities that we're gonna be using all unit long when we're talking about gases. I've got did the same sort of thing yesterday at the beginning. I think it's a great useful technique for making sure that we've got these quantities in mind. So yesterday we talked about pressure, force per unit area. In this unit, we're gonna really talk about how fast something hits a wall or how often something hits a wall. Because when we're talking about pressure, we're often talking about the pressure that a gas exerts on the inside of a container. So the way can I, I can push harder on the inside of a wall is I can hit it more often and I can hit it faster. And so there's some ways that I can increase that pressure that we'll talk about. A volume, obviously, is very important. Space occupied. Cubic meter. Now, we're going to look at some simulations, which are amazing again today, that have ginormous <laughs> containers of gas. But we'll let that slide. But it's interesting to think about how big of a container of gas are they representing in these PV diagrams. Kelvin, you remember, for temperature. Kelvin not degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit. It's an absolute scale because the kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature. Average kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature. So for example, right now, the temperature in my, in my room is, uh, you know, maybe 295 Kelvin or so. But that doesn't mean that every single molecule in this room has the same kinetic energy. It's the average kinetic energy. And that's the kinetic energy of a single particle. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit as, as well. And then hopefully you remember a little bit about a mole, not the furry things that dig up our yards. How many times have your science teachers used that joke? A thousand? It gets pretty old, I think. Anyway, a mole is just a fancy way of saying a lot. So we have a lot of ways that we say a lot of something like a dozen donuts, oh, that sounds delicious, or a ream of paper, 500. So a mole is a ginormous number of particles, six times 10 to the 23rd, we call that Avogadro's number. It's a ginormous number. So lowercase n, you remember, is the number of moles. It's like the number of dozens or reams, but a ginormous number. Big N is the number of particles in your gas, and N naught is Avogadro's number on the equation sheet, just in case you forget. Now, I've got gas laws coming up, and we're going to talk about those variables and how, if I vary one of the, vary one of the variables, what happens to the other ones? I am going to say the names for all these gas laws, but you don't need to know the names for all these gas laws. You just need to focus on the ideal gas law, but it's useful to, to, to see how if I change one variable, how a, another specific variable changes if I keep everything else constant. So when you see all these names, just remember that Mr. Stradman is the uh, coach of his school's academic team, and I'm super into trivia, which is the reason I have all these names. So if you're on your school's academic team, you probably know some of these words from um, some of your academic uh, team competitions. We call it Scholars Ball of Kansas. Okay, first, this is a simulation we're going to use. And what I like to do is try to simulate four gas laws. 
So once again, I'm using FET. This is called the gas property simulation. And these are things that you can find. Just Google FET, P-H-E-T, gas properties, and you're going to get a link directly to it. Great, great folks there at the University of Colorado in Boulder. So let's look at this simulation. I got to put some particles in there. So I'm going to put some particles in there. Let's put, let's put 400 particles in there, let's say. And I want to do a couple things. The first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to keep that volume constant, but in uh, change the temperature. You'll notice up here I've got the temperature, and I'm going to change the temperature. And I want you to see what happens to the pressure. So I'm going to increase the temperature. And look, as I increase the temperature, I increase the pressure. Why is that the case? Well, because those molecules are moving faster because they have more kinetic energy. So they're hitting the inside of the wall more often and faster. What does that do? Increase the pressure. Now, if I slow down those molecules, decrease the temperature, you'll notice they're hitting the walls less often, less fast, less impulse, less force, less pressure, unless that pressure went down. The next thing I'd like to do is I'd like to keep the temperature constant. And when I keep the temperature constant, what I'd like to do is I'd like to change the volume of the container and see what happens to the pressure. So I'm going to increase this volume. Let's increase it. Oh, let's increase it way out here. You notice it's 34.8. Let's see what happens when I let go of it. Ooh, big drop. Why? because now the inside of the container is bigger. It's a larger area. A larger area, smaller pressure. Remember pressure is equal to force over area because those molecules are hitting the inside of the container just as hard because they're moving just as fast. The next thing I'd like to do is I'd like to keep the pressure volume constant. Well, there we go. And I'd like to, um, this is going to keep the pressure constant, but I'm going to heat it up and see what happens to the size of the container. Look at the size of the container. As the molecules hit the inside of the container faster, the inside area has to get bigger in order to keep the same pressure. And if I slow down those molecules, you'll notice that the container decreases in size to have a smaller area to keep the same pressure. The last one I wanna do is I wanna keep that same volume, but I'm gonna pump in some more gas molecules. I'm gonna pump in some more gas molecules. I want, to see, I want you to see what changes. Does the temperature change? I don't see the temperature change. Does the pressure change? Ah, the pressure does change. Do you see that? We got more molecules sitting the inside of the container. That makes complete sense. Okay. So let's head on back and let's look at a couple of different graphs that I've got for that. I'm gonna close this simulation and I'm gonna click there and I'm back to that. And what I wanna do real quick is show you a couple of different graphs that I made. And this first graph I've got is pressure versus temperature. This is called Gilusac's law. I'm probably butchering it, but let's, let's say that's the pronunciation. And I've got pressure plotted versus temperature. If I change the temperature and a constant volume, the pressure goes up. So pressure is proportional, ooh, not R. Pressure is proportional to temperature. Awesome. It's looking like, a, looking like a pretty good law there. Next, pressure versus volume. This is if I keep a constant temperature, but I change the volume. As I increase the size of the container, this was measured in width to remember, the pressure decreased because there's a bigger area on the inside. So pressure is proportional to one over volume, okay? That's Boyle's law. But always was kind of interesting to me that Boyle's law was a constant temperature because you think if it's boiling, it has to do, not the case. Okay, the last one they're gonna look at is Charles's law. And Charles's law is if I keep the pressure constant, but I change the temperature. As I increase the temperature, the volume increase to maintain the same pressure. So volume is proportional to temperature. So I can put all these together in the ideal gas law.
And I've got two different versions of here of the ideal gas law. The top one is the probably the one that you're most familiar with. That's PV is equal to little n RT. That little n is the number of moles. In the bottom equation, I got capital N. That's the number of particles. Look at these two different numbers. That's like a regular looking number. This is a wicked small looking number. How in the world do I go from one to the other? I just divide by Avogadro's number. Take 8.31, divide by Avogadro's number, and I've got Boltzmann's constant. Now, I didn't graph one of the laws. <laughs> you notice that? And the law that I didn't graph was the one where I changed the number of particles. Now, there's a couple ways we can look at that. If we keep a constant volume, what happens to the pressure? If I keep a constant pressure, what happens to the volume? That's kind of called Avogadro's law. But just for time's sake, um, I decided to cut a little bit short. So let's do a quick practice, if you don't mind. And I want to use this PV is equal to NRT law. And specifically what I want to do is I want to practice ranking temperatures. So this is something we haven't reviewed yet, but you know this is a PV diagram that I took a screenshot from uh, the amazing folks over at the Physics Aviator. We're going to look at this same <laughs> picture three times. This is time number one. And the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to rank the temperature of the gas from highest to lowest by state. And you notice that there's four points that's represented on my PV diagram. This is a cyclical process. We're not worried about anything else except, except ranking the temperatures. Now, if PV is equal to NRT and N and R are constant, then it would make sense that PV is proportional to T. The product of pressure and volume is proportional to temperature, which means as I go this direction on my graph, the temperature goes up. As I go this direction on my graph, the temperature goes down. So I can already for 100% sure know that C is a higher temperature than B and D, and B and D are higher temperature than A. But what I'm not quite sure is which one is higher temperature, B or D. Now I can kind of do a quick guesstimation, but with something like this, I would want to make sure that I actually do a little bit of what I always call plugging and chugging on the old shimmering calculator like we did last time. So the task was to rank the temperature. So if you're watching me after live, just hit pause and do your calculations. I told you the number of moles, Remember, R is 8.31. Calculate those four temperatures. Now, a couple of folks mentioned the live watchers. I super appreciate the live watchers. I think you can still maybe pause it and then just restart it. I hope that's the case. So pause it. And what do you get for your temperatures? I got 269. Whoo, 1,698. Ooh, let's say they're all in Kelvin, okay? Temperature in Kelvin. Got to remember units. That was a bad boo-boo in my fault. Then I got, whoa, 5,593 Kelvin. That's a really high temperature. And then finally, 887 Kelvin. So if I were to rank these, clearly C is higher temperature than B, which is higher temperature than D, which is higher temperature than A. Kind of what we thought would be the case. Okay, now switching from kind of momentum slash energy to a lot of energy and specifically the law of conservation of energy. You remember we said at the beginning that this video is gonna be about momentum and energy. Well, here is uh, the big dog of conservation laws, the conservation of energy. And this is the first law of thermodynamics, which is a law of conservation of energy. Now, I've got our third simulation of the session for us. And this is a great simulation, once again, from the physics aviary, where you have a box and you can do some things. And we're gonna look at two things. We're gonna look at what happens to the temperature. If you remember, temperature is proportional to the kinetic energy of the particles of the gas. We call the kinetic energy, when we're talking about the first law of thermodynamics, we call that internal energy. We represent it with a U. 
and that equation has delta u in it. So we're going to want to look at that temperature and see what happens to it. The other thing we're going to want to look at is to see if this piston is worked on. Work is a verb. Work is a way to transfer energy mechanically. The other thing that we're going to want to look for is heat. Heat is also a verb. It's a way that we transfer energy thermally through heating, adding energy, or cooling, removing energy. So when we're looking at the simulation, we're going to want to look at those two things. Work, there's a little arrow, and heat, there's a little arrow, and then we want to look at temperature. Okay, so let's look at this. Now, work done on gas, that's important. We're going to want to make sure to talk about that too in just a second. So I'm going to Slip back over my simulation. Okay, I'm going to hit begin. Once again, just do a quick search for um, gas lab, the physics aviary, and you'll be able to find this no problem. So the first thing I want to do is I want to insulate my container. That way, no energy can transfer in or out of it thermally, only mechanically through work. And so what I'd like to do is I would like to move this by 0.1 meters. And I'm gonna push in on it. And when I push in on it, you'll notice that I do positive work. If you recall from physics one, work is force times distance times the cosine of the angle. If I'm pushing to the left and it goes to the left, the angle is zero. The cosine of zero, not one, positive one. Gotta remember positive because that's super important. But if I go, Again, point, ooh, what happened to temperature? Let's look at the temperature. Let's see, ah, temperature goes up. Now, what about if I go by larger steps? So let's say if I go by 0.5, let's see if the work changes dramatically. Let's see if that, let's see if the work is big. Ooh, big work. And also the temperature changed a lot. Okay, I'm gonna move the piston all the way back out again. And the next thing I'd like to do is I'd like to uninsulate my container. And I'm going to move the, the piston. And I want to see if you notice any temperature changes. So I'm going to uninsulate it. And I'm going to see if you notice any temperature changes down here. So I'm going to push the piston in. But let's go by smaller steps again. When I push the piston in, you'll notice that the temperature doesn't change. But when I put the, push the piston in, I do positive work. And you notice that I have a heat arrow going out. That's energy leaving the system thermally. We call that, uh, we, the Q would be through cooling. There would be energy transfer through cooling. I do positive work, negative heat. Positive work, negative heat. Look at my temperature. It doesn't change. The next thing I want to do is I want to change the environment. And if I change the environment, you'll notice that the temperature changes as I decrease the temperature. But look here, this is super important. As I decrease the temperature, my delta U is negative. And when I do that, you'll notice that the W, the work, is a small arrow and the heat's a big arrow because the heat's negative. Look at this one more time. Smaller work arrow than heat arrow. And what happens to my temperature? It goes down. I flip back to the high temperature. And that's the reason that happened. Okay, let's go ahead and head back over to our simulation, our um, presentation, I should say, not simulation. We we're just looking at the simulation, and I'm going to click on that, and now we're back here. And what I want to do quickly is just kind of summarize the first law of thermodynamics. So here's my first law of thermodynamics. Remember, delta U is equal to Q plus W. Delta U is change in internal energy. That's the kinetic energy of the particles. Q is energy transferred through heating or cooling. That's energy transferred thermally. And W is energy transferred mechanically. Work is a process. Heat is a process. How do we represent these changes? We represent them on a PV diagram. And we represent them on a PV diagram. We're talking about pressure on the y-axis, volume on the x-axis. But there are a couple terms that we need to remind ourselves about PV diagrams before we get started with them. The first is a thermodynamic state. This is a point on the diagram, and it's a set of conditions for a thermodynamic system at a specific point in time.
and it consists of a set of state variables. State variables, the ones we talked about right at the very beginning, pressure, volume, temperature, and amount of gas, moles or number of particles, however you want to say it. And then the last term that we kind of need to make sure that we remember about is a thermodynamic process. This is a line on a diagram that connects two points, two states in that gases existence that we're graphing on a PV diagram. Now, one thing we need to remember about PV diagrams is time is not on the graph. The only way time is represented on the graph is if I tell you what order the gas exists in the states. Amount of time we're not worried about for PV diagrams. Okay. Those quantities, delta U, W, and Q, we need to remember them. This is the first one, really important. W, work. On the AP Physics 2 equation sheet, the W in the first law of thermodynamics is the work done on a gas, like somebody grabbing a piston and pushing it on it. Another way we can look at things is how much work the gas does to the surroundings. We say that's the work done by the gas. The equation in AP Physics 2's equation sheet is work done on the gas. But we're going to ask you both ways. Work done on the gas is the area under a PV diagram, but not a regular area, a negative area under. If it's work done during a cyclic process, it's the area inside of that cyclic process. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Internal energy, and we'll talk about why it's 3 half PV in just a little bit. But that's how we can calculate the energy, the internal energy in joules. And we calculate change in internal energy delta U, which is in the equation, by taking final internal energy minus initial internal energy. And energy transfer, the way we calculate that in physics too, is we just take and subtract the delta U, take the delta U minus uh, the W, I should say. Okay, let's review ourselves some processes. I got two processes on this graph, isobaric constant pressure. Which processes are isobaric? Well, whichever ones the pressure doesn't change. So I'm looking at process B, C, and process D, A. Those are both isobaric processes. Which processes are isovolumetric? Sometimes you'll say isochoric, but usually in the AP Physics 2 exam, it'll be isovolumetric. -vol well, the ones that have a constant volume. So process A, B, and process C, D are isovolumetric. Two more processes to look at real quick. This one is an isothermal process. That's a constant temperature. A isothermal process, the delta U is zero because you remember U is the internal energy. It's the kinetic energy of the particles. And if the temperature doesn't change, the, delta, the U doesn't change, the delta U is zero. How can I tell if it's a isothermal process? Well, I, what I normally do is I take the product of the P and the V and see if it's related to the, pro the product of this P and V. And with a little bit of rounding or approximation, they're pretty darn close. The last process is an adiabatic process. That's when the Q equals zero. That's when delta U equals W. This is a process where no energy is transferred through heating or cooling. Now, how can I tell if it's adiabatic and not isothermal? Because this graph looks a lot like that graph, is you got to kind of do that same PV thing again. Check the PV here, check the PV here, and they're different, which means it's not going to be an isothermal process. But how can you tell if it's adiabatic process? Well, they're going to have to tell you in the AP Physics 2 exam because you can't find the area under this without calculus, which you don't need to be able to do for the AP Physics 2 exam. So let's look at a quick example. And what I wanna do is I wanna find the work done in a cyclic process. Now look really closely. It says in this problem, you will need to figure out the network done by a gas. So let's see if we can figure out the network done by a gas in the cyclic process. So if I'm looking at this process, the first thing I'll notice is that the 
work done here, work done on the gas is negative. But the work done by the gas is positive because the gas is expanding, pushing out in the same direction that the system is moving, the system being the piston. And in this process, I've got positive work done on the gas, but negative work done by the gas. And it's a smaller amount of work. My work amounts are this whole area here minus this area here. And so what area is that? It's the area inside of the box. So how am I gonna figure that out? Well, I just need to figure out the area of that box. So if you want to do a quick pause and I've got all the numbers written down here for you. And you may be saying, Mr. Storm, I think you uh, didn't read the graph very well. You kind of made some rounding. That's all good. It's all good. I just, I just rounded a couple of ones. It's all good. Now, how am I going to figure out the work done? I'm going to find that area. So hit pause, do a little calculation, and see what you get. Now, Mr. Trevin, why you put the moles down there? I don't think I need another moles. You don't need another moles. But they gave it to you up here. Sometimes it's important to know when not to use a number. Now, I got the delta P to be 345,000 pascals, and I got the delta V to be 1.95 cubic meters. The delta V is this amount of my, of my um, box, and the delta P is this amount of my box, and the work obviously is going to be the area inside of it, and that's going to be positive work done by the gas, it'll be negative work done on the gas. And that amount I got was 672,750 joules. Now I got lots of sig figs there. I just wanna make sure if you're pushing buttons in your calculator, you're seeing the same number. Work done by the gas, positive. Work done on the gas, negative. Okay. One more practice problem. This is the one that's kind of a doozy. This is the one that's kind of a doozy. And I'm gonna ask your polite help to help me out with this one and submit your answers later on in that Google form. So what I've got here is the heat added in an isobaric process. The way we'd say that in the AP physics exam is the energy transferred to the gas through heating. What they're interested in knowing is the Q. Now, how can I figure out the Q? Well, I gotta figure out the delta U and the W and subtract those numbers in order to figure out the Q. So in this case, heat is entering your gas to cause a rise in temperature. The gas expands to keep constant, uh, to keep pressure constant. So what I've got here is an isobaric process and I'm going from the left to the right. So this is state number one and this is state number two. How do I figure out Q? I figure out Q by figuring out delta U and subtracting W. If you remember, how do I figure out delta U? I need to figure out the three halves PV at each of those points and subtract them. How do I figure out W? The area underneath. Now, if I'm using this equation, I'm talking about the work done on the gas, which in this case is negative. It's negative because the gas is expanding. This arrow is going that direction. So what I've got here is the information. And what I'm gonna ask of you guys politely to do is to help me out. And what I mean by help me out is, I'm gonna have this information here. And what I want you to do is on that Google form at the end, I want you to tell me what Q did you calculate? So remember, come on back here to about the 34 minute mark on the video and find it and you'll be able to help me out. And we'll talk about that tomorrow at the beginning of the electrostatics video. Okay, thermal conductivity, we got two more things to talk about. Thermal conductivity is how I can transfer energy through a barrier. Right now, it's colder outside than it is inside my house. I want to make sure that that thermal, that that energy doesn't transfer from inside my house 
to outside my house because that'll increase my heating bills. And so I want to make sure that I have good insulation. And the physics behind that is called thermal conductivity, thermal conduction. So heat, just a couple of review of some terms. Heat's the process through which thermal energy is transferred between systems at different temperatures. And it's energy transfer spontaneously from a higher temperature to a lower temperature system. The next term we need to remember is the word conduction. This is not something that I'm gonna spend a lot of time on this video, but you remember there's three different ways to transfer energy thermally. Conduction is where there's actual physical conduct, conduct, contact between um, objects. That's when I can conduct um, energy thermally. Another way I can conduct energy is through radiation. That's like I'm standing outside in a sunny day. The electromagnetic waves from the sun will be transferring energy to me. Another way to transfer energy thermally is through convection. Convection involves differences in densities of higher and lower temperature fluids, buoyancy, and mixing. And the last thing you really remember about is elastic collisions. If you remember, the kind of collisions that we're talking about in AP Physics 2 are elastic collisions. So the collisions that we're going to talk about in this simulation are going to be elastic. And specifically, we're going to be talking about thermal energy going from one box of gas to another box of gas through this barrier. And they're going to tell us the rate at which the energy is being transferred. And we want to see what factors affect that. Okay, so let's do that. Get to this next simulation. Hit begin. You notice that my rate of thermal energy transfer right here is 90 kilojoules per second. That's the rate at which energy is being transferred through this barrier. Now, what are some things that I can do to change that? Well, one of the things I can do to change that is to make the temperatures of both boxes the same. You'll notice that I have no energy being transferred now. But as I increase the difference in temperatures, and right now it's 10 degrees. If I increase it again, 180, I doubled it. 270, I tripled it. 360, I quadrupled it. So that's a pretty good one to notice, right? Temperature difference and rate of thermal energy transfer proportional, directly proportional. Okay, what about the depth? If I increase the depth, you'll notice that I've got a bigger barrier through which I can transfer energy. If I have a bigger barrier, meaning that it's a bigger cross-sectional area, then I can get more energy through it. Similarly, if I increase the height, you'll notice that the rate of heat transfer goes up. But what about the thickness? As I change thickness and make it bigger, you'll notice that the rate of energy transfer, ooh, it popped back up to a big number because look how narrow, look how not thick <laughs> that barrier is. But if I increase the thickness, you'll notice that the rate of energy transfer goes down. Now, there's one that I haven't changed yet, and that's this material. As I change this material, you'll notice that that heat transfer rate changes. Why does it change? Because of a property of that material that's called thermal conductivity. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. So, got my equation. This is directly off the equation sheet. Just do a quick Google search for AP Physics 2 equation sheet and you'll find it on AP Central. This is my rate of thermal energy transfer. That's that Q over T. K is my thermal conductivity. A is the cross-sectional area of my barrier. That's the height times the depth. My temperature difference is the temperature difference between the two containers. And L is my barrier thickness. Now this is called Fourier's law. Once again, this is just me being a little bit nerdy and having some trivia for you. But this is named after a Frenchman that lived in the late 1700s, um, early 1800s. And he's a mathematician and a physicist, but also interestingly enough, one of the first people to talk about the greenhouse effect. So. Some places credit him with the discovery of the greenhouse effect. Well, let's not argue that on a physics presentation. Now, just a quick data table. This is a nice thing to pause and look at. 
energy transfer rate, joules per second. K, that's my thermal conductivity. Now, what I want you to do is tell me something kind of interesting. If you remember from yesterday, I talked about extensive properties and intensive properties. In that Google form, if you don't mind, can you tell me what sort of property is thermal conductivity? Is it an extensive property like mass or volume? Or is it an intensive property like density? And I got my temperature difference measured in Kelvin, my square meters cross-sectional area, and finally my thickness in meters. So I've got a practice problem for us to look at. And in this practice problem, they've given me a ton of information down here in the bottom. But what they're interested in me calculating is the rate of energy transfer, the Q over T. How am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to use Fourier's law. And I've got all the information right here for us. I've got the thermal conductivity of AU, which is gold. Wouldn't that be a weird insulator? <laughs> Have insulation in your house made of gold? Anyway, that's the one that this simulation chose to use. I've got my depth and my height that I can use for my cross-sectional area. I've got my thickness really small because it was in millimeters. I converted it into meters. And they've given me the temperature of the left box of gas and the right box of gas. And what they want me to figure out is my Q over T. So if you want to do a quick practice calculation, hit pause, and then I'll tell you what that value is here in a second. I'm going to round some. I'm not sure I'm liking all of those sick figs. I got 1,598-ish thou, uh, thousand joules. Okay, last topic, probability and Maxwell distributions. Now, this is important because this is a for sure multiple choice question on the AP physics exam or possibly having you draw a Maxwell distribution. A Maxwell distribution shows you the number of particles on the y-axis versus either speed or kinetic energy. Either one of them will work. Now, what we need to remember is what does that kinetic energy, what is it proportional to? Well, if I have the kinetic energy of a single particle, that top equation is the one to use. That's the equation on the equation sheet. But that's the kinetic energy for a single particle. And we're seldom going to be looking at a single particle. So instead of that, I want to know the number of uh, the amount of kinetic energy in the entire container of gas. I need to multiply by the number of particles in the gas. But I don't oftentimes know the number of particles. I oftentimes know the number of moles. And if you remember, Kb is related to Avogadro's number. So if I do a little bit of derivation, I get K is equal to 3 halves NRT. And if you remember, NRT is PV. And so a very useful version of this equation is 3 halves PV. Now, what a Maxwell distribution shows me is it shows me what the prevalence of a speed or kinetic energy is versus that speed. There's a really great video in AP Classroom that I did about topic 2.2, video three. So that'd be a really great one to, to look at. I've got the same picture, I think, and I'm gonna use the same simulation, which is what I wanna do right now. And what I wanna do with this simulation is I wanna show you just two things real quick. One thing I wanna show you real quick is what happens when I increase the temperature. When I increase the temperature, you'll notice that the curve flattens out and widens. And the reason it flattens out is because I have a set number of particles. I envision this as kind of like a bar graph. As I decrease the temperature, the prevalence of high energy particles goes way down. But the total number of particles stays the same, so it's taller, closer to the left, which is lower speeds. So I've got a quick graph to show you that has all of this nice and summarized for us. So 
area under the graph is constant for the same amount of gas, I imagine it like a line over bars in a bar chart. Lower temperatures have a tall peak closer to the x-axis, tall peak closer to the x-axis, and higher temperatures have a flatter graph spread out farther along the x-axis. Now, what should we take away from this session? Let's remind ourselves about our agenda. We started off by talking about the gas laws and quantities. Then we looked at the first law of thermodynamics. That's the law of conservation of energy. Then we looked at PV diagrams and thermodynamic processes. ISO, and then those three words, isobaric, isothermal, iso um, volumetric, and adiabatic was the fourth one. Then we looked at thermal conductivity, making sure the inside of my house is nice and warm and the outside is cold. I want that to be the same. And then finally, we talked about Maxwell distributions and probability. Now, just a reminder, here's the feedback form. I sure appreciate all the kind words you guys gave me yesterday about um, how the presentation went about fluids. It was super nice of you guys. The URL is tiny.tinyurl.com slash AP Physics 2 2021 feedback. And on that one, if you don't remember, I had two questions for you. Thermal conductivity, extensive or intensive. And what was the Q on that isobaric process that we had with the gas expanding? So next time, we're going to talk about electrostatics. So make sure, give a big thumbs up to the video. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that notification button for all the great videos that AP's putting them out to help you review for this year's exam. Thank you so much. And hopefully you made your learning of AP Physics 2 a little more fluid.